She loved to run in the countryside, but best of all, she loved the fact that she had once lived amongst the tall, bare-leafed trees. Even now she could feel the memories of the wind blowing through her long, wavy brown hair. Whenever she had run, she would laugh to see her dog running beside her, his tongue at the side of his mouth as he panted to keep up with her, and her own tongue would be locked at the side of her broad, cherry-red smile as she concentrated on finding a way through the groves of trees. She had always been good at running, and perhaps that was what had saved her. She remembered the pond in their garden, frozen solid on the first day of winter, the pond that she and all of her family had known by the edge of the dam, and, for an instant, she could hear the toads again, basking and croaking in calmer, warmer times, better times before this time. They had not lived in a rich house. Theirs was a farmhouse with all of the wealthy houses overlooking the valley that led to the reservoir. The war hadn't seemed to touch them. Soldiers still needed food, and they had a farm that would produce good food, whether there was a war on or not. It was then, as she ran her delicate fingers over her short-sleeved dirty dress, that she remembered the taste of her mother's fruitcake, the rich buttery sauce on the frog's legs, and all of these delicious foods seemed to make her think that everything that had happened to her was all a terrible dream. At first, no one had thought that they had anything that would bring the bombers to their part of France, but soldiers needed steel, bullets, guns and tanks as much as they need food from the countryside. When the forges and factories started to rise on their good farmland, she wondered if they would take some of the wealthy landowners' estates, but she knew that they had helped these invaders to their country, and they had signed a deal with these devils. Always, they would say, steel needs water. And your land is closest to the reservoir, where there is plenty of water. And anyway, this will bring money to the land. And after the war, they always said this, after the war, it will be better. But she knew that they had collaborated with them to save their own land and their own skins and let her family's farm be sacrificed to the war effort. She was a strong girl, and she had heard the bombers cruising in the sky like some kind of deadly swarm. She'd been in school when it happened. The professor was telling her once again to pay attention and try to make your own writing look as if it can be read for once. It was true that she had never been able to concentrate on anything to do with school. She was good at running and and that was it. It wasn't as if she couldn't think. She had an imagination that was bigger than the universe. It was just that she couldn't write it down. She remembered how the professor had stopped and raised her ear to hear the thrum of the engines. In the distance, outside the school, in the town square, even the old men playing bool had stopped their incessant chattering and had turned their eyes skyward to strain at the sun-drenched winter clouds to get a better glimpse at the terrible swarm of deadly planes getting ever nearer. Now, children, do not panic. I'll have... The professor's voice faded behind her as she had leapt from her desk and sprinted out of the school and towards her home and family. All of the work on the farm had made her strong, but it did not prepare her for the blast and crash of the bouncing, scattering bombs that fell like rain on the stones and brickwork of the dam. If she had had the time to think, then she would have taken something out of the house that would have helped her to survive, something practical like warm clothing or even food, but she had grabbed the first things that she could see from the deserted house. A mother's brown hat, two dolls and a battered wooden cot that her grandfather had made for her seventh birthday two years before. When the first bomb fell upon the farmhouse, her farmhouse, her family's farmhouse, 
It was as if the ground had been twisted like putty in God's hands. There was nothing that could have prepared her for the din and crash, and in a blind confusion the only place she could think of hiding was in the well in what had once been their vegetable garden, but now looked like a great open wound in what was left of the cornfields. But that had all been before now, one hundred lifetimes before now. She remembered the J.I.'s voice as he had found her, cold and shivering in the ground. It was the dull sandals on her feet that had shown him where she was in amongst the rubble. When he had first appeared in front of her, on a morning a few days later, when the winter's sun dazzled her, and he was in shadow before her, she thought, she had hoped, that it was her own father. But she knew that that was all wishful thinking. She knew by the ragged scarring of this once beautiful valley, all generations of her family were gone, and all for the want of water for steel. He spoke to her in a language that she did not know, but she could tell that he was kind and was not going to harm her. Little lady, we're going to have to get you out of this place. It ain't safe for a girl like you. She had been in a daze. And when she was taken by a truck, then a train, and a plane to England, England, where the bombers had come to destroy the factories, but had taken her beloved farm from her, her heart had been filled with amazement at all of the sights and sounds as she had travelled away from France, worst of all, with the smells of their terrible food. Her heart had beaten, pounded in her chest, even though she would not speak to these people who had robbed her of her family and all in the name of war. But she did write, scribbled and tangled as the letters were. She wrote her story in a way that would have astonished her professor on any piece of paper that she could find. When she had first arrived, there was no way for her to sleep, except in the nave of the great cathedral, and still she wrote. She wrote by candlelight at the foot of the altar, huddled in the vast darkness with the dolls by her side, and she would furiously scribble, and it was, feeling frightened, distraught and misunderstood, that she heard the bombers coming to the great city to wreak their revenge. Many years later, when the war had finished, and the ruins of the cathedral were cleared, in amongst all of the wreckage and ruin, two dolls and a cot were found, by a bundle of papers covered with a scribbled story of a girl who loved to run with the wind blowing through her long brown hair. With the higgledy-piggledy, gravity-defying piles of broken dark bricks about him, he was pleased that there were no bodies in the darkness of the bombed-out building. When he was younger, he loved the idea of danger, and the thought of playing at games of war with all of his friends would have brought a smile to his lips and a battle cry to his throat. Now all he wanted to do was rest in the shelter of the rubble and get back to his mother and his home, by the side of the dark blue river. His eyes were tired, sunken bags seemed to pull his mind further down into despair, and still he thought of his home. In the courtyard, with pale fingers of moonlight pushing through the dust-filled air, he could see the crooked pavement beneath his muddy boots. He spoke to himself in a voice that was no bigger than a child's whisper. It's been a long time since this place has been used. As his eyes got used to what little light there was, he could make out remnants of coloured glass in the high vaulted windows. 
He laughed, an empty, echoing laugh that reverberated the length of what was left of the sacristy. A church, of all the places that I could be, a church. He laughed again as he strained to see the bones splintered, rusted cement and dusty remnants of the richly carved pews that would only make firewood now. The church might not have been dressed in all of its finery, but with all of the other buildings in the town washed away by the flood of bombs, it would make a good shelter for him on this cold winter's night. He knew he would be safe in the church for at least one night, and he allowed himself a faint, thin-lipped smile as he moved his long, bony fingers over the old, torn jacket that was losing the fight against the cold that was clutching at his bones. Making sure that he could find a place in amongst the ruins where he could light a fire without being seen or heard and, hopefully, not smelt, he caught his flickering reflection in a single pane of glass that had somehow escaped the devastation. He was not pleased with what he saw, from the top of his short brown curly hair to the legs of his stolen camouflage trousers. He remembered the day that he had taken them, one day, one week or just a lifetime ago, from the cowering soldier in the city who was even more scared than he was. His heavy boots, one size too small, were taken from an enemy soldier who had left them by the side of the road as he slept. He muttered, His loss and my gain. At the memory of his borrowing of the boots, he muttered again, Better to have blisters than to have no shoes at all. Since the war had begun, he had started to doubt the way that he lived, if you could call stealing boots and clothes a living. He had always had the greatest of intentions, the best of hopes for his future life, and now he was reduced to someone that had no confidence in his own character. This was not the way that he had been brought up when he lived in the country with his mother. He had been good at running. He had loved to swim in the cool, calm lake water. To distract himself, and for an instant, he wondered what had happened to his favourite horse. He had ridden her on so many summers when he was a child, and it was only as he tried to remember this childhood pet that he remembered his own children. He would talk to them all day, every day, and how they all laughed when they visited Grandma's house and the roasted dinners that they all ate on the long wooden table in her farmhouse on summery Sundays a lifetime ago. Thinking of food, he remembered the mouldy bread and cheese that he had eaten in the last town he had drifted through like a ghost, and it only brought annoying hunger to his already stretched, empty belly. If he were to find his family and his mother, then he would never need to steal again in order to survive. Gaining confidence and feeling bolder, he started to trace his way through all of the rubble at his feet. Perhaps he hoped that he could find the offerings box. But then again, what good was money when there was nothing to buy? When his fingers rested upon a corroded tin, his heart skipped a beat, and he had hopes of food. But it turned out to be an ammunition box, filled with bullets. But then again, what good are bullets when you do not have a gun? He felt small salty tears fall on the grenades and bullets in the box as he thought of the last time that he had fought side by side with comrades who were no more. As he made to sit on a pile of bricks and remember the fallen dead, he had made a poor choice of a place to rest as they tumbled down and left him sprawling in the dust by the side of a stack of tins, tins with no labels that had been hidden in the body of the rubble that had once been the kitchen. It was as if he had won the greatest prize in all of this earth. He could not tell what was inside or how long they had been there. What he did know was it was food and he was hungry. If they had contained dog food, cat food, or just plain rotten food, he was going to eat it. And eat it, he did. The strangest mixture of pilchards and peaches, rice and steak, until he could eat no more. This time, as he curled up to sleep with a cement beam for a pillow, 
His smile was real and contented as he was just one day away from his mother's home. The next morning, at the bottom of the hill, looking towards the brow of the stone road that led to his home, he was delighted that he had travelled so far. He had so much to tell his mother and his children. He was facing happiness and his heart pounded with excitement in his chest as he raced on weary legs to get closer to see his family home. It was only as he reached the top of the old road by the river's bank that he saw nothing but craters where once his childhood memories had lived. Tears streamed from his eyes and fell into the fast-flowing river at his feet.